You know that thing in your body that makes you grow, keeps you young, called growth hormone? Well, growth hormone has very little effect on how you actually grow unless it is converted to IGF-1. So in today's video, I'm going to be giving you a full explanation on how this works, how this conversion works, how you can implement this in your life, and how you can increase this conversion from growth hormone to IGF-1 for maximal bone growth, muscle growth, and cartilage growth. So stick around so I can get into that. If you're a first time viewer, my name is Jacob, and in my videos I first break down how exactly things work, and then I explain how you could implement those things inside of your life. I don't just give you the direct tips, because having a good understanding is very important, because everything is subjective, it changes with your life. So I want you to be able to implement it based off your specific situation. With that being said, let's get straight into the knowledge. So as I said a second ago, IGF-1 is the form of growth hormone that essentially causes all the growth inside of your body. Now, IGF-1 has a much longer lasting effect inside of your body. And this is because of the half-life of these two things. Growth hormone playing its role in growing your body or growing these different tissues is going to have a half-life of 20 minutes. So it's not going to be playing its effect for that long. Compared to IGF-1, IGF-1 has a half-life of 20 hours. So when you increase the amount of growth hormone being converted to IGF-1, then you get a significant increase in the amount of growth you have individuals who are much taller it's not because they have more growth hormone specifically it's because they have more growth hormone that was converted to igf-1 now in this video i won't be breaking down how exactly igf-1 causes bone and tissue growth but i will be breaking down how it causes muscle growth now it causes muscle growth by binding to the receptor of your muscle cells and it causes this gateway to open which allows glucose to flood in and fuel this muscle and allow it to grow to a bigger larger cell let me give you an analogy to help you understand this a bit better imagine you are a kid home alone and you're obsessed with video games always got your headphones on and you're never listening for the doorbell to ring if somebody rings the doorbell you don't hear it, you go back to gaming, and nothing changes. But if your dad's home, then he's going to yell to you, Hey, go grab the door, and you're going to have to get up, grab that door, and talk to that person, or let that person in. Now, what's essentially happening is your dad is your IGF-1 in this case. The IGF-1 is telling your muscle cell, Hey, we need the stuff to open this door. Open this door so we could let this glucose in. And then that glucose is let in, muscle is fueled, we're all happy. Now this wouldn't be a complete IGF-1 guide if I wasn't going to bring up the fact that growth hormone is quite important to have high levels of IGF-1. Simply, growth hormone does convert to IGF-1 and that's pr the primary way that we get IGF-1. But, how does this happen? So first of all, our hypothalamus is pretty important because this is what secretes growth hormone releasing hormone. And that growth hormone releasing hormone goes to, to the anterior pituitary and causes the anterior pituitary to release our growth hormone. Now once this growth hormone is released, then it goes to different areas. One of the areas it goes to is the liver and the growth hormone that goes to the liver is ultimately converted to IGF-1. So it's important that we have a functioning hypothalamus, functioning anterior pituitary. You don't want to have issues in those areas or else everything you do for your IGF-1 levels simply aren't going to play much of a role. Now, growth hormone itself is a completely different topic. In this video, we were talking how we could maximize the amount of growth hormone that is arriving at that liver to secrete IGF-1. Now, you should also note that IGF-1 isn't only produced in the liver, it's also produced in muscles after training to support localized growth in those areas or in those muscles you just trained. Larger muscles, often have a bigger release 
but that's not important because it is just a localized release. So I'm not going to be talking about training in this video, but obviously intense training, training hard, and getting your resistance training lifts in is very important for this. But in this video, I will be talking about more specific, more nitty gritty things that you could improve. Now that you understand the basics of how it works, let me get into the specific things you could implement to increase the amount of IGF-1 in your body. And the first thing is very potent. I want to say that this is likely the most potent thing that you can do for your IGF-1 levels. And this is going to be L-Arginine. Now, L-Arginine is actually how they test for hyperpituitarism because it stimulates the pituitary gland so much that it releases a significant amount of growth hormone and a significant amount of that is converted to IGF-1. So simply to test for this, they ch just test the levels of your growth hormone and your IGF-1 after taking this supplement. So you can imagine if they're using this to test for functioning structures within the body, it's likely going to be something that really improves your levels. So that's the first thing I'm naming L-Arginine. The next thing I want to mention is inflammation. Now, I'm not going to talk much on how to in reduce inflammation because it is pretty simple. You simply just need to have a healthy gut. Don't, e don't eat a bunch of things that are going to really irritate your gut. I think having a high fat intake is good, but don't have a higher fat intake than carb intake or don't be intaking an absurd amount of fat. That's obviously going to irritate your gut. And then also seed oils. Seed oils are quite bad for your gut. And then don't overtrain. You've heard that a million times. Overtraining is once again another thing that's going to harm this. But this does flow perfectly into the next thing I'm going to say, and that is the liver and big surprise, the thing that is secreting the IGF-1, we want to have in a healthy state. And we also want to maximize the amount of receptors that GH could bind to to cause this IGF-1 secretion within the liver. So I am going to be talking about how to maximize your liver health right here. The first thing I'm going to mention is make sure some of your fats are from a source such as olive oil or avocado. It's good to have a mixture of saturated fats and these fats because saturated fats have their benefits on other hormones and then these have their benefits on your liver and certain organs inside of your body. And then the next thing is deep sleep. It's actually really important that you're more focused on deep sleep than the amount of sleep you're getting. Make sure you are going to bed at the same time every single night because this is what's going to set your circadian rhythm, getting sunlight and all of that. Just things that are really going to make your body consistently at, fall asleep as soon as you hit the pillow and be out for the night sleeping really deep. You don't want to be waking up throughout the night kind of moving around. Oh, I'm thirsty, getting up, grabbing a drink of water. Those are all things that are going to impact your level, reaching a deep level of sleep. And deep sleep specifically for your liver health is going to be much more important than the amount of sleep you are getting. And there are countless other examples of this being the case. So I really recommend you focus on the time that you are going to bed versus the amount of sleep you are getting. Obviously, I am not saying that you shouldn't get eight to, eight to nine hours of sleep, but what I am saying is that this is more important. And then the next thing for your liver is going to be fasting. Eating in a eight hour window and then not eating for 16 hours is going to be perfect for your body because then your liver is going to have time to detoxify, clear all these things inside of it, and really just maintain that healthy level. Well, if you're constantly eating, then it's just constantly trying to clear toxins and it really has no time where it has a complete break. So when you take a longer fasting window, it's going to really help maximize this level of health. And then the next thing I'm going to recommend is breath work. If you haven't heard of box breathing, that is the best form of breath work. Essentially, what's important with breath work is that you're having the proper ratios of carbon dioxide to oxygen and having this ratio is going to help your liver function properly be healthier and on top of that you're also going to have higher quality sleep if you maintain the proper breathing patterns while while you're asleep 
and many people think that breath work isn't that effective because you have all this time throughout the day where you're not performing breath work and then all this and then a very minimal window where you are performing breath work but there have been countless studies showing that just br doing breath work twice a week is enough to re-regulate your breath or your breathing patterns because that is how we are naturally supposed to breathe and how we currently breathe. The issues that we have with breathing are just something that's come from the modern day, not because it's actually how we're supposed to breathe or how we were meant to breathe as humans. And then the next thing I'm going to be bringing up is the sensitivity of your growth hormone receptors. Now, you need to aim for one gram of protein per pound of body weight. This is going to really help maximize the sensitivity, and you could end up going up to 1.2, but then above this, it has some harmful effects, so I recommend staying in the range of 1 to 1.2 grams per pound of body weight. And then the next thing is just sunlight. And yes, I mentioned that for the reason earlier, your circadian rhythm, but also because just having sunlight hit your skin is going to help these receptors function properly. The next thing that is good for your growth hormone receptors is going to be thyroid hormones. Low levels of thyroid hormone are really going to impact the amount of growth hormone receptors inside of your liver. So it is important that you're eating a consistent amount of calories and carbs. People with very inconsistent diets don't have good thyroid hormone levels because their body doesn't know what the hell is going on. One day they eat 1500 calories, next day they eat 3000 calories, next day they're eating 4000, then they're eating 500. A lot of people do not pay attention to the amount of calories they're eating and really just judge it off how full I'm feeling when really... You're going to feel much fuller if you're eating more saturated foods. When you first start a cut, normally it's quite hard. It feels like you're force feeding because you switch to all these super saturated foods compared to these fattier, more dense foods. And it's really going to throw you off. And that's the main thing that will make you realize how important it is to, tra to track your calories. I challenge you to spend one day eating strictly clean food, same amount of calories as normal, and you will realize how hard it actually is to maintain the same amount of calories when you're eating super clean. So because of that, it's important that you are aware of what you're eating and how caloric dense it is. You may be eating inconsistent levels of food each day, which is going to downregulate your growth hormone receptors due to low levels of thyroid hormones. The next thing I have for you is to maintain your insulin sensitivity. So your insulin sensitivity is important because of what I mentioned earlier. It's essentially acting like insulin when it is opening up the doors for your glucose to come into your muscles. And because of that, if you have bad insulin sensitivity, then you're not going to see as much of an effect from your IGF-1. So how do you maintain insulin sensitivity? Now, I'm going to make a full guide on this in the future and an insulin video in the future, but insulin sensitivity is simply around the idea of carb intake. Now, you need to make sure you're intaking your carbs at specific times and pay attention to the glycemic index of carbs. You want to be eating lower glycemic index carbs when you aren't training, when you're simply just completing activities, then you eat low glycemic index carbs. When you are training, about an hour into your workout is when you are at the biggest growth hormone release spike. And when you are at this peak spike, it's important to get high glycemic index carbs or sugars specifically. If you consume sugars then, then it's going to be good for your insulin levels. And then the next thing I have for you is going to be the amino acid leucine. Now, leucine simply allows IGF-1 to have a more anabolic effect. And you could Google what proteins specifically have high levels of leucine, but your best source for a leucine-based protein is going to be whey protein. So whey protein is great to have after you have those big spikes. So after you finish working out, then it's great to consume your protein shake then if you're drinking protein shakes or because you are getting this amount of leucine and it's going to help this IGF-1 that you just had released create a more anabolic effect inside of your body. 
That is all I have for IGF1. If you enjoyed this content, consider subscribing, leaving a like, and join my email list if you want small things you can implement throughout your life. But as always, remember, as lifelong learners, Brisbane Casty is our grindstone for success. Keep on grinding, boys.